Welcome to this webinar, which is a very uh, topical um, webinar. We want to look at where we are at with our climate plans in Germany and in Europe. We had a very clear judgment, a very clear decision of the Constitutional Court in Germany. Um, it's uh, very well known. Every German, uh, or not all Germans believe in God, but all of them believe in the Constitutional Courts and its decisions. And uh, it was said that um, climate plans are not uh, sufficient, which uh, was confirmed by climate activists um, who are among our guests today, very renowned guests. On a European level, we had a new leading uh, strategy, the European Green Deal after the European um, elections, and that is something we achieved together. We are very proud to have achieved that, and we are very proud to count a commissioner, the Commissioner for Environment, among us here. So this will be our topics for today. How good are these German and European climate plans? Are we on the right path? Are we doing things the right way? And what has to happen um, for us to keep this planet livable and uh, keep its nature intact for the future? And um, before we start, I would like to say that, of course, uh, measures have to base themselves on what is necessary. So from a German perspective, we are dis disappointed uh, when, yes, we might see a higher level of ambition uh, by the government, but no actual measures are following. That's not enough. We need tangible measures, tangible action, proactive uh, measures. Um, that's the only way to save our climate and uh, not just uh, beautiful words written on papers uh, just in time before the general election. So I'm looking forward to our debate tonight. Uh, we have very different positions and I think it's going to be very uh, interesting. We have 1,600 registrations for the webinar. So a lot of people and we are delighted to have so many of you here. Um, just a few technical remarks. Uh, we will hear our panelists, first of all, one after the other. But um, everyone is also free and very welcome to ask uh, questions in writing. Uh, you can also um, vote for the questions that you like. And uh, if you give a positive vote, we have a ranking of questions. So those that you deem to be the most important will be taken up. And of course, um, the webinar is also about passing on the messages here. So please feel free to tweet, uh, to be active in your social networks um, and talk about what uh, inspired you today, what um, you found very um, interesting, what you see in a critical way. So go ahead and, and do so. And once again, we have two languages here today, German and English, and you can listen to both of them via the interpretation. Now, um, first of all, I would like to pass the floor to our climate uh, spokesperson, Michael Bloss from the um, Green uh, Party in the European Parliament, who is uh, from Baden-Württemberg, who they believe is the most beautiful federal state in Germany. Thank you very much uh, and a very warm welcome uh, from me as well to this webinar. We called uh, this webinar a, a decisive year for climate protection and we do think this is a really a pivotal year because uh, we are supposed to reach uh, the Paris uh, Agreement's goals, reduction below 2%, etc, etc. Et we also have a uh, climate protection law on, in, on a German level, and we will hear more about uh, measures uh, in uh, before the summer, fit for 55. So this is the framework for climate protection for the next uh, few years, and that's happening at a European level, at a German level. And today we had um, the decision in Germany to adapt our climate protection law, uh, to look at it and see whether measures are sufficient. That is what we're going to do today. Because whatever we manage or do not manage this year will be decisive for the next decade. And this in turn is the decisive decade for us to reach the Paris Agreement goals or not. So that's why this is such an important topic. And I'm really delighted to have these renowned uh, participants here. We have the EU Commissioner for uh, Environment, Virginius Zinkevicius. Um, welcome. 
It's really an honor and a pleasure to have you here. He uh, would also consider himself uh, a member or um, someone who sympathizes with the Green, uh, Greens, our Green uh, Commissioner. We also have Claudia Kempfert, a climate economist from the German Institute for Economic Research. And uh, she's a very intelligent and a very renowned commentator of German climate politics. We also have Erika Mink, who is responsible for this policy area at uh, Thyssen, um, an important industrial player who we also want to include in our debate in terms of um, their participation. We will also hear later on from uh, Carla Riemsma, who is a very um, well-known activist with uh, Fridays for Future. And we will also hear from Jakob Blasel, who uh, was one of the founding members of um, Fridays for Future until um, he decided to move into politics. He's now a candidate uh, for the uh, German Bundestag for the federal state of Schleswig-Holstein. Uh, so, first of all, we will hear a keynote from our Commissioner Sinkevicius about the current state of the re Green Deal and the package of uh, Fit for 55. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sven. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, uh, for, for the introduction. Uh, of course, good evening to, to, to everybody and once again. Thank you to, 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 to both MEPs uh, for this very kind invitation. It's very important to keep the European Green Deal in the public eye and to explain very clearly what's at stake. It's a policy that's tailored to our times and I'm always very happy to discuss with people its details. So thank you and I'm very much look forward to face-to-face to -face exchange uh, as soon as this becomes possible again. It is tailored to our times for two reasons. First of all, it addresses the three big environmental crises, climate change, biodiversity loss, and, and pollution. It's designed to tackle these in a systemic uh, and coherent manner because they are all interrelated. Climate change, for instance, worsens biodiversity loss, while the causes of climate change and air pollution are often the same. All three crises are underpinned by our unsustainable use of resources. But the good news is that they also share solutions. Uh, marine and terrestrial ecosystems absorb around half of our greenhouse gas emissions. So when we protect nature, we're also fighting climate change. And these ecosystems provide services that are fundamental for adoption, uh, like absorbing excess fluid water. Uh, flood but uh, limiting urban heat and acting as a buffer against natural hazards and coastal erosion. This is why the Green Deal is a systemic solution. We are not only talking about climate, but, uh, but about solving the broader environmental crisis, exploiting the synergies between policies and avoiding trade-offs, and doing this in a manner that turns these challenges into opportunities. The second thing about being tailored to our times is the recovery aspect, because the Green Deal is also roadmap to economic renewal. President Biden recently announced a similar pathway for the US when rejoining the Paris Agreement. So this thinking is gaining ground. So 18 months after we announced the deal, what have we actually delivered? Well, it's a lot by any standards. To take a few examples, now have the climate law agreed by the college to establish climate neutrality by 2050. We have a new climate target for 2030 reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% compared with 1990 to help us reach the climate neutrality object. We have biodiversity strategy, farm to fork strategy to make our food systems healthier and more sustainable, and a new circular economy action plan. We also have an updated industrial strategy, a climate adaptation strategy, and many other strategies, including pro hydrogen, methane, and offshore renewables. And the work continues. We are now revising the climate and energy legislation framework and working on a new forest strategy and a proposal to combat global deforestation. And today we adopted a zero pollution action plan. When you take all these aspects together, a new legislative framework emerges setting us on a clear path to green transition and carbon neutrality by 2050. These strategies and actions plans to look great on paper, but that isn't the point of the Green Deal. It's all about implementation and active engagement with 
parliaments, citizens, and other stakeholders such as enterprises, NGOs, and local authorities. So how we are doing it in practice? In 2019, domestic EU greenhouse gas emissions were down by 24% compared to 99, while GDP grew by 60% over the same period. But that rate of change would not have allowed us to aim for the Paris Agreement objective. Last year, European leaders agreed the 2030 target of at least 55% and new nationally determined contributions target was submitted to reflect this increased ambition. Last month, the co-legislators reached agreement on the European climate law, which enshrines these higher targets in law. So when you ask, are we in line with the Paris Agreement? My answer is yes. What we propose is in line with typical global scenarios limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. In fact, the EU objective of climate neutrality by 2050 is more ambitious than the requirements of most of the models used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for achieving climate neutrality between 2050 and 2070. And the Fit for 55 package to be adopted in June will allow the EU to meet its new ambitious uh, ambitions for 2030. As you know, legal proposals will cover a wide range of policy areas, including more ambitious and extended emissions trend, uh, trading, efforts sharing between member states, land use, land use change and forestry, and also renewables, energy efficiency, energy taxation, and a carbon border adjustment mechanism. In addition, there are other measures on the way to increase our carbon sinks, like the forthcoming forest strategy, that should focus on biodiversity-rich and carbon-rich ecosystems. Our analysis showed that the new 2030 climate target is both responsible and feasible. The transition will be unprecedented, but it will bring enormous rewards, not just economically, but socially as well. And that success will set an example for the rest of the world, provided, of course, we manage to agree an ambitious Fit for 55 package with college students. Beyond our direct climate ambitions, the Paris Agreement goals involve a very broad process of change. They are integrated into many policies, which must all take us in this, that same direction. The 2020 new industrial strategy is a good example. It's there to help industry lead the twin green and digital transformation while also driving our global competitiveness and increasing strategic autonomy. It's now been updated to integrate lessons from the COVID crisis and accelerate the movement towards a regenerative economy. So we're, together with the industrial strategy, we also adopted the new circular economy action plan. There, the stress is on reducing our consumption footprint and doubling the circular material use rate uh, in the space of 10 years. And that will help us meet the climate goals while also safeguarding the supply of raw materials. It's already creating jobs, added value and attracting investment. In the same way, the implementation of the Zero Pollution Action Plan will stimulate innovation and many of the innovative technologies and services it promotes uh, bring co-benefits for the climate. To take one example, the decarbonization roadmaps developed by the energy intensive industry will make a massive difference to greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. But there will also be a positive impact on air emissions, particularly on, uh, uh, and, and that's also why the revision uh, of, of uh, the EU rules on industrial emissions is looking at how uh, the industrial emissions directive could do much uh, more than lowering emissions. The industrial emissions innovation obser observatory will also play a key role, monitoring innovations and speeding up the identification of new techniques that may qualify as best available techniques. So the last point I would like to make about delivering the Green Deal is actually about the member states. As you know, the Recovery and Resilience Facility together with the budget are a unique, EU budget of course, I mean, are a unique opportunity to make the right investments and policy reforms that can lead to a change in production and consumption patterns in line with the Green Deal. It is an unmissable chance to transform our economies, societies, our urban environments, our buildings, the way we farm and respond to our citizens' aspiration to live in a healthier and nature-rich environment. I would like to finish by stressing the international aspects of the European Green Deal. These are the turbulent times, but we continue to work closely with international partners to uphold the legacy and the integrity of the Paris Agreement. In all our diplomatic actions, the EU pushes for more ambition and does it 
utmost to prevent others from backtracking on existing commitments. And in fact, all our new trade agreements now also include a Paris Agreement conditionality. To sum up, we will pass the Paris test. Yes, we must and we will, but we need to support from the co-legislators, from the member states, from stakeholders, from citizens movements, and the support we can muster. Thank you again for this invitation. My apologies for not being able to stay and take questions, but my services will remain to listen and provide me with the outcome of your discussion. Thank you once again, and I wish you a successful discussion. Thank you, Virginius. Uh, this was an excellent overview. And uh, of course, you can't listen now to the excellent analysis of Professor uh, uh, Claudia Kempfert, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you will meet or have already met. And uh, Claudia, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, is there all this good enough, what we are doing in Europe and, uh, and in Germany? And of course, yeah. with a presentation as a professor is supposed to present. <laughs> Yes. Ja, also wenn ich hier schon so eingeführt werde, muss ich natürlich. Ja. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, if you introduce me like that, I have to. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, the Commissioner, uh, Sven and Michael. I have prepared a few slides, uh, just a few, just to uh, make it very clear where we are. And I'm looking forward to today's discussion. So where are we? What's happening at the moment? I am also uh, here as um, on behalf of the um, expert um, committee for environmental research, uh, Stefan Ramsdorf and Wolfgang Lucht are other members of this committee and um, we have also, um, they have um, also worked on uh, the um, relevant expert opinions, which were the basis, among other things, of the um, Constitutional Court's judgment, recent judgment. So uh, just to um, reiterate, where are we at the moment? You can look um, at the figures here. You can see uh, even after adaptations, there's still a gap between our ambitions and the actual implementation. 6.7 gigatons CO2 budget is what we have left. The longer we wait, the more emissions we cause, the sooner we will be in conflict with the objectives that we are, have to meet according to our commitments. And the more we're pushing the burden onto future generations as um, as said in the judgment by the Constitutional Court, that is not admissible. So we do need to change something in the implementation. This um, gap is uh, still rather large. Um, well, at least uh, emission uh, re reduction goals have been increased to 65% in Germany. Now, that's still not compatible with the Paris Agreement's goals, still not enough, but it does um, close the gap a little bit in its adaption to uh, European objectives. So it's better than before, but still not enough, still not what's necessary now. And what we're suggesting what's necessary is that looking at current measures, should be based on the CO2 budget approach. So look at which mechanisms are uh, to be selected, how much uh, do we have left, what's the path we're on, and then act accordingly. So the, 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 the danger with um, setting objectives like uh, 2020, 2030, 20, and so on, is that you push, you're pushing measures back, and then two years before 2030 arrives, we're, oh, we have to act now, because otherwise we'll miss our objectives. That's what happened just before 2020. So that is the risk that you run, that you're pushing measures back, delaying, delaying. So it's better to use this budgetary approach and uh, then uh, you know how much flexibility you actually have. So looking at this slide, it's broken down by sectors. So again, clearly, if we're working with linear reductions, emissions have to go to zero, down to zero at the latest by 2038. 
And uh, even with the adaptations we have now, we can see that uh, coal has to be stopped um, much earlier than that by 2030 in order to be compatible, compatible. And also a lot has to be, a lot more has to be in transport than we have committed ourselves to do at the moment. So we're not really at, on the right um, path at the moment in order to achieve our goals. And if we don't act at all now, then in uh, seven years, we'll have used up the budget. So the, the earlier you start, the more um, you have left. So I'm not really a fan of these um, final, that these dates are working towards certain dates because that just means delaying and delaying and you're putting off concrete action now and now is when it has to happen, the, the sooner the better. And then this uh, was a study that we did for the European energy market where we can really prove that it is possible technically uh, to work with 100% renewables. It's also economically efficient um, and it will lower energy costs. So in such a system with 100% renewable energies um, it would be the following. Emissions would go down to zero uh, by 2040 in this scenario here. And uh, we would uh, get away from conventional energies and get to 100% renewables, as I said, and this uh, graph shows clearly that the uh, need in primary energy would be halved, but you would need more electricity, of course, because many sectors would then work with electricity instead of other types of energy. But the more we can save electricity, the, the better. So, of course, not uh, lots of uh, huge quantities of hydrogen. If because that would mean um, having uh, to expand our uh, supply with renewable energies by five or seven times. So this means that conventional um, types of energy resources has to be have to be phased out. Um, natural gas by 2040 should be phased out by 2040. I know many people don't like to hear it, but investing in such uh, plants now, that's uh, those are stranded investments. They're not compatible with the uh, path that has been agreed uh, with the Paris Agreement within the EU. And so it's really necessary to be honest when you look at the figures and, and, and invest in expanding renewable resources. And that, on the other side of that, is phasing out nuclear energy, uh, coal, fired energy, natural gas. And what I'm missing in the discussions, I'm looking forward to that tonight, is how to really do this conversion and practice, um, stepping over because of the, we're at the beginning of this transformational phase uh, two and three, where you have to uh, get renewable energies into the whole system. And that means system flexibility, uh, security of supply, digitization, those are the central issues. It's technically feasible, but the right framework is what's missing at the moment. Also in the EU Green Deal, we still have gaps as far as that is concerned, but also uh, in the individual member states and in Germany, because we're not looking to use 100% renewables uh, in plans, apparently. You still, you still read fossil fuels, um, investment in nuclear power. Some member states might want that, but it's not really compatible with the objectives of the Paris Agreement or with the economic objectives that we have because nuclear power is just very expensive comparatively. So we will need more electricity. We will have to um, invest in decentralized renewable energy, solar energy on all the roofs. Uh, all the infrastructure that we have, uh, faster expansion of uh, wind energy, um, onshore and offshore, expand all other renewables and build a system that makes that possible. That's our, these are our requests uh, at the European level, but also at the German level. And uh, for this year, so for the short term, we have to triple our expansion goals for renewables, 10 uh, gigawatt wind, 20 uh, gigawatts of solar energy per year. That's the, those are the results of a study that we have published in the framework of scientists of future. But uh, we're seeing that not enough wind uh, energy is being created because the framework conditions aren't great. So we need more areas, no volumes have to be offered. It has to be uh, simplified. Market barriers have to uh, be phased out. Financial investment has to be possible. And of course, um, 
also promote and support uh, storage research. So there are many different types of measures that we need this year, that have to be decided this year, that we need quickly. For instance, for wind energy repowering, where the conditions currently are impossible, you have to wait for seven years for your license uh, rather than just starting um, your your new plant. So there's a lot of things. Uh, there are a lot of things that are necessary. But really, the renewables, a massive expansion of renewables, is the most important thing, and that would also be good for the economy, as uh, Commissioner Sinkovic has just said. And the second thing that we need from Europe, um, this is a study that we did for Germany, more citizens. Um, and more de uh, citizens energy and more decentralized networks, because that's um, that would be the path. So these are my central messages for tonight. I do think it's a huge opportunity, and we're about to talk about this, that this also makes sense in economic terms, not just in technical terms, in order to leave the crisis behind us. So the three, tri the triple crisis that we have have to be solved this way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia, and uh, Carla Rinsma has also joined us now. Hallo, aber erstmal, damit hier auch keine Verwechslung auftritt, nicht Fridays for Future, sondern... First of all, just to make things clear, uh, we will first hear Erika Mink from ThyssenKrupp. Sometimes when I look at brochures of ThyssenKrupp, I get the impression that uh, you were taken over by Fridays for Future, that you are now an environmental NGO. But well, let's hear about what you think, um, Ms. Mink. Do you think the German and European plans are good enough? Is that going to help us uh, to make sure that our steel becomes green? Well, thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. I think what we've heard so far is um, correct. I think, well, in principle, we are we agree because uh, the problem isn't that we are not aware of what's at stake. The problem is into implementation and how to implement uh, everything. Um, and the fact that we set higher goals will not necessarily change things. I think uh, we in the industry, especially in the steel industry, are the ones who have to make large contributions and we are willing to do so uh, to really play our part. But what's being discussed uh, at the moment in Germany, climate neutrality until 2045, is, is a huge challenge for us. And I I'm glad for the opportunity to tell you what these challenges and problems are and what the solutions are according to us. This might uh, cause some controversy, but well, I'm glad uh, that we have that space uh, for discussion and debate here. So when we look at goals here um, that we have um, at the moment, I think we would all agree that this is also something which is, uh, well, that people just come up with, where people just kind of improvise because we have general elections coming up and they don't have a plan on how we actually want to implement these. And that leads to a lot of challenges for us in the steel industry. We have a lot of leverage, uh, that's true. And uh, just to give an example, um, for ThyssenKrupp Steel, our goal is to go along with the EU uh, Green Deal uh, climate neutrality until 2050. So 20 million tons of CO2 emissions have to be saved by then. 2.5% of the annual emissions of the Federal Republic of Germany at the moment. Until 2030, we want to achieve a reduction of 30% compared to 2018, which corresponds to 6 million tons. If we... Um, convert that to green steel, that would mean that uh, uh, it's the same amount as we need for one year of uh, cars, um, new cars registered in Germany. 
Wir haben eine Roadmap, wie wir um, We also want to achieve that with green hydrogen. Um, we have a roadmap, we have a transformation plan, a step-by-step -step plan, but that means um, that we have to find a site, which is uh, the size of the state of Monaco has to be... Um, is mounted and has to be replaced by different equipment, uh, different uh, construction facilities or, or projection facilities and so on. But still, even if we have these facilities, where do we get this hydrogen from? Which energy is being used to produce that hydrogen? We want green hydrogen, um, which is produced with a green or renewable energy, for example. But how do we get it? Where do we get it from? That's, for example, a big challenge. And we need the infrastructure to transport that as well, because the amounts that we will need until 2030 will simply not be available um, from green production. So as a bridging technology, we will need natural gas. There's no way around it. The technologies that we have mean that if uh, once we have um, the pipes and the infrastructure for hydrogen, which we have in the Ruhr area, for example, in Germany, um, so we can use these for hydrogen. And so once we have these, um, the hydrogen will still not be available in the amounts that we need. So even if we have the infrastructure, we need a different kind of technology. We need natural gas first, and as soon as sufficient hydrogen is available, uh, we can use it to operate our facilities. But to achieve a CO2 reduction um, by 2030 the way we want to, we need this kind of bridging technology. And I know that it's um, something that is very much debated. Next problem, next issue for us. The numbers uh, simply don't add up for us, even if we do use natural gas, because this means a huge amount of investment for us. Until 2050, we will probably have to invest 10 billion euros, and that's not all. I'm sure you are all aware that a green hydrogen and g green energy will also cost us more, at least initially, initially than uh, fossil fuels. And that will, of course, lead to a big increase in operating costs for us. So in order to reach these goals, we need support when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to transformation. And um, you mentioned uh, some figures. Uh, you, um, Ms. Kempfer, you meant, uh, you said that uh, renewables really have to be um, drastically expanded in their use, and we definitely subscribe to that. One gigawatt green hydrogen, excuse me, five uh, gigawatt of green hydrogen will be available by 2030, according to current calculations, but we will need one gigawatt alone. And... Um, in the future, we will need uh, six giga, which uh, is equivalent to 50% of all energy required by German households. So we know what we have to do and we have the plans for them, but we need a legal framework. We need a financial framework to really implement all these steps, especially in the first years, because those will be the most difficult um, years. And there are five areas where I think in particular, we will need support uh, as ThyssenKrupp and also as uh, the steel industry in overall. We need fair competition on an international level, on the international steel market. I'm sure you are aware that we have a um, overproduction. For example, the overproduction in China corresponds to the annual steel production, the total production um, of steel per year in Germany. So with that kind of capacity, we simply cannot afford um, support to using the carbon leakage um, protection. Uh, the, the international competition is very harsh, and that is why um, emission trading should stay as it is until 2030, um, the allowances and so on, just to be able to overcome these first uh, critical years of transformation and to be able to finance them. Because if we lost these allowances now, we would simply lose a lot of money and that money could not be invested into green transition. And well, then that would be out of the question for us. 
So if there is a carbon border adjustment planned, then hopefully that uh, should be something on top or in addition to the carbon leakage uh, production. And if that's not possible, then I think we, well, should um, be excluded from the CMAM in the first round. Second point, of course, um, we want green energy, but that shouldn't mean, or that cannot mean for us, um, additional taxes, additional um, financial burdens, because otherwise our operating expenditure would go up once again, steel would get more expensive, and once again, uh, we can't afford uh, that to happen. Even now, we cannot pass on these costs to the market. So a certain level of financing instruments has to be available. Carbon uh, contracts for difference, for example, as they are being discussed right now, they are really of a paramount importance for us to be able to finance these additional operating costs, which um, this green transition will entail. These instruments should at least be available until 2030. Also, when it comes to subsidies on a European level, the legislation there should also be adapted so that operating costs or investments um, can be supported uh, in order to accelerate this transition and to, well, really get through these first years of uh, transformation. And as a last point, demand for green steel because once again, we think that we need a legal framework or at least some political instruments uh, to promote uh, the demand for green steel. We could think about uh, quota, we could consider that maybe um, public procurement um, really focuses on green steel or creates some green guidelines. Um, I'm uh, based in Duisburg here um, where we have a big production plan um, and a bridge was built across a motorway here around the corner and the steel was brought in from China. This is the reality and that's the reality that we're up against uh, day by day. And uh, that is something that we really have to look at, where we really have to be honest, take an honest look together with politics, together with stakeholders and NGOs to think about what kind of measures we need, uh, what kind of concrete measures and steps um, do we need in order to achieve these goals. And we think that we need a kind of pact, an agreement for transformation in the steel industry where everyone concerned sits down at the table together and decides on the steps that have to be taken to reach these goals. Because, well, if your goals are too ambitious and then um, in the end you will end up having something counterproductive because then some industries might will opt out of this uh, transformation. They might just uh, go to uh, different countries or outsource, etc., etc. I spoke to a lot of representatives of uh, small and medium enterprises and they are all very worried. They are saying uh, we really need to know what's going to happen. We need some tangible solutions because that's what they said. Uh, we need to know where we have to invest and where we can invest. We need to decide on that this year. And we don't have a legal framework at the moment. We don't know about subsidies. We don't know about emission trading in the future. We don't know about carbon border adjustment as an alternative to carbon leakage. Is that going to happen or not? These are all the topics that are important for small and medium enterprises and for us as well. Vielen Dank. Das war spannend. Gruß nach Duisburg. Und die, ich würde eigentlich. Well, that was very interesting. Hello to Duisburg. I would like to pass the floor to Jakob directly. Because um, it was interesting. Uh, it's, it's also a good training. Or what it's like to speak uh, to representatives uh, of, of uh, the industry as a politician. Jakob, is uh, other um, plans from Europe and Berlin for climate protection uh, sufficient? Are they good enough? What do you think? And that, of course. Uh, also, um, is your opportunity to react to what uh, Tizenkop just said. 
Well, I was um, very uh, <laughs> surprised uh, because there were so there was such a long wish list. So you don't want to be make part of be part of the emissions trading, but you do want a carbon border adjustment so that steel from China. Uh, falls under emissions trading, uh, the other way around, uh, Ms. Mink said, and then also money for the transformation, if I understood correctly. Well, you know, that's quite a lot. Um, I think, uh, I hope that there are other ways to transform um, the steel sector, but I would like to uh, talk about the review of the Climate Protection Act. I mean, after the judgment in this situation, the federal government uh, is really praising itself um, um, because they're saying, well, we have much better climate goals, but still not good enough uh, for 1.5 degrees. And far from um, the goals that Ms. Uh, Kempford um, described. So the, that's the field of tension, the two cornerstones. So we've got the new Climate Protection Act by the federal government, uh, way too low for the objectives for 2030 and 2045, everything too little, too low globally. Also looking at Germany's responsibility uh, for the world and on the other hand we have this more ambitious uh, path but we don't have the measures for it they've not been um, adopted the spd would be ready to do more for renewables but not uh, for co2 uh, pricing the cdu wants to review the cd uh, the co2 pricing but not expand renewables at all and so the federal government is a bit, little bit lost and the only thing they were able to decide was to change a little bit on paper, but it was far from enough. And I think that's um, really not very encouraging. That's not communicated in the media, but it feels that way. I mean, some more progressive authors from the Tuts have um, even told us, well, how could climate activists still be unhappy with these climate goals? I mean, it's so much better, but I was surprised. I'm really surprised uh, at how positive the media, media echo was to this review of the Climate Act, because it's a small step on paper without actual measures being adopted. We need to get away from the injection uh, engine. We need higher CO2 prices, also um, with uh, social measures um, and feeding it, because we have this uh, CO2 price that's not being paid back to the citizens. And so the burden will actually grow for lower incomes because of the CO2 price. And that makes the CO2 price not something that will find majorities. Uh, and it would be different if we had a per capita uh, lump sum um, paid back to citizens. So lots of things missing. And this new uh, Climate Act hasn't really changed that. So I am really um, curious to see what measures will be um, suggested in the next few weeks, but I don't really expect it to be enough. And I feel like it's almost uh, the going to be the issue for the next government what to do about climate protection. So I am quite happy that the Green Party has started with their election program and even more satisfied that uh, we uh, will be able to even improve on that election program, a proposal in our election program, um, but we have time for that because I still think it's not enough. So that was all from my side. Uh, Jakob likes to take over and facilitate and, and pass the floor to people. So um, he wanted to cut, pass the floor to Carla. So please, I would like to respond to uh, what Jakob said, because the main point here, what we're seeing in climate um, policies at the EU level, but also at uh, the German level, that we're also talking, they're always talking about the um, years as objectives and percentage reductions. But the main indicator, uh, the main indicator isn't mentioned, the CO2 budgets. So what's a CO2 budget? The IPCC 
the international panel uh, under the United Nations dealing with the climate um, and collecting lots of scientific knowledge on climate, they have worked out how many tons of CO2 may still be emitted globally in order to not go beyond that critical line of 1.5 degrees warming. And you can then break that down to uh, countries, to Germany, for instance. And what we see again and again is that that indicator is being ignored. For instance, in Germany with the Climate uh, Act, uh, of course, you want to be more progressive. And, um, and does it uh, really fit with the 1.5 degree uh, goal? But nobody talks about this budget. So now we're looking at 2050 as the next goal line. That's way too late. Of course, that's part of the Paris Agreement that we want to have climate neutrality globally by 2050. But uh, of course, in order to get there, we have in many countries will have to be climate neutral way before that because uh, countries, further developed countries, uh, industrial countries have already used up their climate budget because they're already emitting too much and they have the technical um, know-how to get there quicker. So that's the topic. This CO2 budget is being ignored. And uh, a similar thing is happening at the European level, at the e um, European Union level. So uh, we have the agricultural policy so a third of the European budget goes into agriculture, the common agricultural policy. That's where the EU has a lot of competences. So we have various different strategies, by the biodiversity strategy, farm to fox strategy. Part of these strategies, some of these are quite progressive, but the main point is that the CAP, the common agricultural policy, that's a lot of money, one third of the entire budget, it mainly ends up being a support for farmers, the uh, support payments. And that should be a major part of the Green Deal in order to really be that. But the agriculture policy doesn't do that. It's really not compatible with those goals of the Green Deal. It is not a contribution for a climate neutral um, agriculture. Of course, there's always going to be emissions from agriculture, but you know, as far as possible, it should be climate neutral and not just um, promote major massive um, uh, agricultural holdings, which is still profiting and benefiting from subsidies um, to this day. So that is a massive problem with the EU um, CAP and uh, the Green Deal working with the wrong goals. So climate neutrality by 2050, for instance, and as an industrial nation or as the EU with all these member states being industrial nations, that's way too late. And ignoring the main indicator, the scientific indicator of the CO2 budget. But that should be the basis. That should be the basis for all um, climate policies. And Jakob has uh, said it for Germany, has mentioned it, that you're always working with these faraway objectives for 2050 and so on. But that's not even under the legislative period for the current government. So you don't have to do anything now. No concrete measures now. That, that's what's missing. And... Uh, the same is true for the EU with the budgets. And that uh, goes with uh, what was mentioned about hydrogen. So in the area of hydrogen, it's still being discussed whether investment in blue hydrogen should be labeled as a green investment. And it isn't green at all because burning natural gas is not climate neutral as a technology. And it's not even something that's bridging towards climate neutrality. It's just something for gas uh, companies to have a future because they're afraid of uh, being phased out too quickly. So we do need much stricter guidelines what um, could be labeled as a green investment. That's what's missing also in the taxonomy that has been discussed a long term, like for a long time under the, on the EU um, level. So if we want a just future, then investment has to be um, distributed uh, fairly as well. And that's not going to be possible if you just label, mislabel a burning natural gas as a green investment. So these are really uh, some uh, main points where improvements are necessary.
Thank you, that was very clear. And uh, over to Michael Bloss. What do you think of all of that? And then we'll start the discussion. Well, thank you. Yes, that was a very interesting discussion because it shows that um, we do need to act in many different directions and many different pathways. There's always uh, the choice, it seems, between either having better measures or better objectives, but that it's not really a choice. You need both. I mean, the objectives are not just something we make up. It's what they are based or should be based on how much CO2 we can still emit. And then that should be um, what influences the measures we take and the goals we set. And what we've seen at the European level, uh, I do see a problem with that because we started with the Green Deal saying that Europe will be the first um, climate neutral continent. That's our um, first man on the moon moment for Europe. And then, as Carla said, we had the new CAP that was disappointing, the taxonomy that was adopted that's a disappointing with the climate um, uh, goal that's 55% uh, percent, it says, but it's only 52 2.8% of real reduction if you look at it closely. So that's also disappointing and not enough for the Paris Agreement, under the Paris Agreement. So that's a little bit of a problem at the European level. Doesn't fit the, the promised um, objectives, don't fit what's being put on the table now. But the measures are still to come in July. And it's very important that we now fight for very ambitious measures because a lot will be decided then, namely, for instance, the uh, CO2 price for energy industry. And if we have more than 60 euros, then that will mean that um, uh, types of coal will no longer be competitive. And that will mean that that's being going to be phased out. And then free allocations, how much is left for steel, for the steel industry or what other um, options are there for the carbon border adjustment, the CBAM. Is there a um, way to protect our steel industry but still make sure that it's um, getting towards climate neutrality? Because the problem with free allocations is that many uh, companies get these certificates for free for CO2 emissions, but that means that there's no incentive for them to reduce their CO2 emissions. And then um, it is fixed, uh, for instance, how uh, much uh, the fleets uh, for, um, for, car, for car makers may still emit. And what we will need is a green uh, phase out for combustion engines. So a lot is going to happen at the European level, and we have to make sure that what's going to be proposed is um, good enough. And then, of course, uh, the questions for uh, expanding renewables will new, need a new or better um, a, pol a better political framework, because what we've seen with the taxonomy that was adopted and the CAP is, of course, the result of uh, majorities at the European level. And one last uh, sentence, Carla. We do have uh, one little um, CO2 budget approach in the European Climate um, Protection Act. It's not a lot, but um, we really fought for it, the Green Party, that in 2023, the EU has to set the CO2 budget for 2030 and 2050. So that will have to be fixed. It's not going to be binding, but I do hope that we can switch to uh, looking at how many tons of CO2 we still have, how many tons are we still allowed to emit, and that we can make that switch. So yeah, save the Green Deal, but uh, we'll have to have elections before that can happen in new majorities. Thank you. Also, because everyone's being so disciplined uh, with the timing, we are exactly on time and I did not have to stop anyone. So thank you for that. I would like to start by looking at some of the questions that the audience has asked. And in order to not let you get too comfortable, let's get to some not so comfortable questions. I'm going to pass this uh, one to Michael. The question, why 
did you not succeed in uh, Baden-Württemberg to phase out uh, coal? What was the reason for that? Because if you are good at everything except high German, which is what people in Baden-Württemberg like to say about themselves, then of course you have to be successful and good at everything. And then a question to Ms. Mink. Uh, German plant uh, constructors for uh, steelworks, Daniele or uh, others, ready for these new technological challenges, or do they uh, do they have the know-how to do it? So, how are you going to build these new uh, plants to replace furnaces? And then another question for Jakob and Carla, um, Ms. Mink from Tristan Krupp. I mentioned something, and also Claudia Kempford could uh, maybe come in on that. So Ms. Mink said what is needed in order to uh, make the jump within the steel industry, Jakob already said, could be more effective. But what do you think, uh, Ms. Kempford? Could we be more effective? And then maybe uh, Fridays for Future as well on that. But mm, the questions are uh, so far not very focused on Fridays for Future, but I'll get back um, to you. Maybe let's go to Baden-Württemberg first. Well, thank you for this question. Well, I also um, was involved in um, getting the coalition agreement in Baden-Württemberg, and I don't think it's that bad. Of course, we can't phase out uh, coal in Baden-Württemberg. That's a federal issue. So we're hoping for uh, better results on the federal EU level. So what we have in Baden-Württemberg is uh, 2030 uh, phasing out at the federal level and at the Landes level. So I really assume that we are going to have um, the phase out um, at that point and a higher price for CO2 as well as 51 euros now. Otherwise, coal is no longer competitive. So we need to make sure that we really manage until 2030 and in terms of supply, energy supply, for example, in Baden-Württemberg, uh, we want to adapt to that. We want to make sure that there is energy security with renewable energy. And I think that's uh, the right approach because when we look at um, the utilities, for example, in Mannheim and Baden-Württemberg, uh, we consider whether um, they are replaced by natural gas or other sources. And uh, we have uh, now decided that uh, we are using other technologies, um, for example, district heating, residual heating from uh, the industry in order to really create um, renewable sources for energy supply. And I think um, that's that's a good uh, mix, a good approach that we've created in Baden-Württemberg. Okay, so that means, if I understand that correctly, the CDU, the Conservatives in Baden-Württemberg, had to subscribe to um, leaving coal behind until uh, 2030, even on a federal level. Hmm. Well done, Michael. And um, I would uh, now like to pass the floor to um, Ms. Mink. You can, of course, make other um, comments, but do you think that you're really able to do what we needed? Yes, uh, they can. Technologies are available. Um, the construction experts for utilities are uh, very much capable of building this uh, transformation, creating the infrastructure for this transformation. But what's very important to me is that we are not living on an island. We're, tie we're, we're a part of an industrial network. And that means that we need the supply. Supply needs to be available. We need hydrogen, uh, which at the moment we do not have um, in a sub sufficient level. And of course, we need demand. Um, we need people to buy these green products so that they make sense from an economic point of view. And that's the difficulty that we have and that other industries have as well, not just the steel industry. We need to make sure that this transition period where we move away from old uh, solutions um, is not 
kind of a clear cut. We need to be able to um, still use these uh, previous uh, solutions um, uh, because they are much more efficient, uh, cost efficient, uh, simply because they are very much uh, calculated to be so. So we need to find a transformation that allows us um, to still use these as uh, long as needed, also to be able to make sure that this is a socially just transition. Um, we try to include trade unions, we are in constant uh, contact with our trade unions, for example, and our works council and that's a very fruitful exchange because um, we're looking at 27,000 employees um, whose jobs have to be made fit for the future so once again how do we manage this transformation in a socially just way uh, in a way that really maintains these jobs um, but still establishes um, the hydrogen infrastructure. So it's not just about plant engineering, it's really about creating the entire system, um, reconstructing a new system. Uh, we are talking about a yeah, paradigm shift, a system shift in the industry, and we really have to make sure that it is workable. Um, I'm relatively new in the steel industry myself, and it took me a few weeks to understand what we're looking at here in terms of technology, in terms of investment, and it is huge, I can tell you that, uh, if we really want to achieve these climate change uh, reduction goals. It's a huge transformation for our industry. Well, thank you. I would now like to pass the floor to Claudia Kempfert and maybe ask you for your opinion on the following. Jakob mentioned uh, the approach, the program that we're looking at. And at the same time, we heard a warning. We don't want any additional costs, extra costs uh, for climate change uh, transformation. That is, uh, according to Jakob, was what Mrs. Mink uh, said. Do you think that these additional costs are necessary um, do they have to kind of be shouldered to really manage this uh, transformation? Well, thank you. I'm looking, f I'm, I'm really enjoying this constructive discussion. I, I, I really want to underline that because I, I do appreciate um, that ThyssenKrupp is um, present here and that they are so open, honest, transparent. Uh, it's something that I haven't seen in the last 15 years, really. And it's something that I've always waited for, that we really address the things that are at stake, that we think about possible solutions together. Um, so that's really wonderful for me that we've reached that point where we sit down together and talk about all this and talk about the fact that we do need and that we all acknowledge um, that uh, we do need a transformation uh, in the steel industry, for example, that has to become uh, climate neutral. And in order to achieve that, uh, from my point of view, and there are three levels which are essential and some of them were mentioned by Ms. Mink already. Indeed, green hydrogen has to be available. How can it be produced is a, a major uh, question. And uh, I'm, I'm glad this was described as green hydrogen, because if we um, work with, uh, well, green or uh, gray or blue or pink hydrogen, then that will create a lot of issues in terms of production and in terms of use, because if um, hydrogen isn't produced properly, then this will create another environmental risk. It would, will create more emissions. It will create other risks. Um, blue hydrogen, for example, uh, uses fossil um, gas to be produced and uh, that creates more emissions and uh, production in environmental, in, in, in just, in, Develop, uh, developing countries uh, will mean that um, some resources will be damaged and uh, there will be a lack of water, scarcity of water due to the use of uh, those hydrogen uh, production types. And so we really have to make sure that we are talking about green production of hydrogen, sustainable production, and then of course, green and sustainable use. And um, well, that brings me back to uh, steel. Everyone who dreams about uh, hydrogen being the new uh, petrol and uh, we'll, we can still drive around in our SUVs um, and still 
uh, continue with our consumption the way we did, um, that's uh, something that unfortunately will not be possible. Uh, it needs to be green and it needs to be sustainable. And how do we get there? Well, first of all, we really need to expand the use of renewable energy. Um, we need to have additional measures, economic measures, economic support for that kind of transformation and these are the projects that we should uh, support on a European level when it comes to priority project projects. Investment alliances uh, would be one example in order to make sure that production costs um, can stay competitive and the products can stay competitive. And we still have to fight against uh, price dumping from uh, China. We have a climate premium, for example, that um, we suggested for steel production, which has a CO2 um, price or carbon contracts for difference built into it in order to create a balance and also make sure that the market isn't flooded with um, Chinese cheap products. And uh, you also suggested um, public procurement, for example, as one approach. Um, public procurement also needs to be um, shaped or designed in a way um, that is not just looking at costs, um, where then in, they do import Chinese steel simply because it's cheap. Um, we need to make sure that these uh, practices are excluded because um, well, cheap products come at a price and that price needs to be a factor in the calculations as well. And uh, thirdly, the in industry or the industries that have to be undergoing this transformation, all these sectors um, really need our support to be able to stay in Germany or in Europe. So um, they need to be our priority in terms of subsidies, in terms of an economic uh, framework. And um, that calls for measures uh, that are really tangible and can really help uh, these companies. So, like I said, uh, legal economic framework and uh, expanded use of renewable energy, green hydrogen production, those would be my points. And I think it does make a lot of sense to have this broad and holistic approach. Well, um, I think I need to check back with you in order to be sure I understood you correctly. What Jakob said was that normally, well, you can understand if um, green uh, steel, for example, is too expensive and cannot be financed by the market, um, then these additional costs have to be paid by someone. Uh, a lot of people say, well, Tyson can just um, pay that uh, themselves because they have a lot of reserves, uh, huge reserves, which is, um, by the way, not uh, very efficient economically. But still, um, you say we want to be protected against the global market via CBAM. Then secondly, we also want the carbon contracts for difference. And thirdly, we would like support um, for our investment costs. Isn't that uh, quite a lot? That is what uh, Jakob cr criticized as well. And do you agree? How do you see that? Don't you think that's a bit too much to ask for? Uh, or is it simply, well, <laughs> to make sure that you get one of these three? Maybe you just ask for one and then or for three and then you might get one. Of course, we also want a carbon contract for difference. Um, we agree with that. But don't you think that um, Ms. Mink is a little bit greedy in her demands? Well, uh, yes, indeed, she does ask for a lot. But it is also true that... This is a major drastic transformation that this sector has to undergo. And it makes sense that in terms of this large transformation um, should be supported in various ways. For example, investment in, in green steel. Um, it doesn't just need, for example, research support. It also needs economic support because we are looking at a lot of money that needs to be invested. But that's why I mentioned these investment alliances um, in order to make sure that um, this is kind of a public, that everyone has a share in it, that ThyssenKrupp also contributes, um, but also the federal states and so on, um, such as with battery production, for example. And yeah, carbon contracts for difference 
it's about the following. If the CO2 price is very high and uh, not enough investment um, is uh, created or is, is available, um, then you need to make sure that you can have some kind of buffer to still be able um, to continue this transformation. So we need to create certain incentives or if they are not available, a certain amount of uh, compensation in order to have a buffer for this investment uh, difference. Um, I, do, I do agree to that as well. And in terms of the border adjustment, the pre-supply chains, for example, the CO2 price, which um, is uh, charged, uh, should really be charged, for example, when it comes to Chinese products, because um, if they flood our market, if even in Germany, Chinese steel is uh, being used to build bridges, uh, then that's something that's not right. So we need to exclude um, these uh, examples these situations from happening and so yes i do agree it's a lot to ask but um, it's what is necessary a combination of different measures because only then can we manage this transformation and i think the carbon uh, contracts also have this dynamic um, approach so we can adapt to the situation okay thank you so I am going to try and translate this for non-economists. So carbon contracts for difference is about the difference between the CO2 price and the market price. And you create kind of a buffer, a compensation mechanism if the price difference is so high. But then free allocation of certificates is not compatible with that. Uh, yes, that's correct. Because if I freely allocate these certificates, I can't um, only, I can't also ask for these carbon contracts for difference. Yes, that's correct. Um, Okay, we might get back to that later on, but I would like to talk to the Fridays for Future activists as well, because we've looked at a different question, which I also um, thinking about quite a lot. Um, it was a question from the chat here. Um, and I think that is something which addresses all of us how do the greens how are the greens are how are the greens planning to reduce um, cars the use of cars to a large extent we have about 1.3 billion cars uh, in use worldwide i think it is a very clear says the person who asked the question that uh, not all of these uh, can be replaced by electronic uh, vehicles so we have to look at the global automotive situation because each new car means production with the use of raw materials, a fuel use, etc. And I do not think that that level of renewable energy um, to make this industry green would be available. Well, yes, the use of cars. That has always been a very difficult topic. How do we get away from using so many cars, Carla? Well, of course, in a fair future, climate-wise, we'll have fewer uh, cars uh, in Germany and Europe in general. That is a truth that may not be very pleasing to the um, automotive industry, but uh, for, there are many reasons for this. We have resources conflicts. We can't just uh, have um, the emissions conflict replaced by resources uh, conflicts for other resources. So, that would be the case if we wanted to replace all of uh, the current cars with electric cars. So, of course, we'll still have cars, but fewer in Europe. So that means that we have to provide the framework for a different type of mobility in cities, in towns, for instance. You have to um, uh, really um, distribute the areas fairly. Uh, cars are currently really favored the favorite. Uh, if you look at the area just uh, set aside for cars, that has to change. It has to become a lot more attractive um, to choose other means of transport, for instance, bikes. Uh, but we cannot forget rural areas. We, uh, Of course, we'll still uh, need some cars because it doesn't make sense to send a 
bus somewhere when it's going to be empty three um, quarters of the time. But there are other uh, concepts like car sharing, other mobility concepts, and the goal is just to have fewer cars without uh, people losing their access to mobility. And uh, one way this can work, uh, the only way it'll work anyways is, is getting away from the combustion engine because um, otherwise uh, transport emissions will not be really uh, reduced enough. And then of course, public transport will have to be expanded and then mobility for bikes, that means stricter requirements and then uh, long-term or medium-term no combustion engines. So it's going to be many different measures coming together and especially mobility is a bit um, trickier than energy and it's diff different from region to region. But we do have concepts in other towns or cities where we can see it's possible and Go, coming from very different backgrounds, but it, it has been uh, done and uh, cars have been reduced in those uh, places and people are still able to get from A to B. So that is the list of uh, requirements. On to Jakob, how are you going to achieve that? I mean, Germans love their cars, especially large cars. I mean, that's uh, practically a, that's practically a legend in Germany. So it's not that simple. Let's look at the next five years, maybe. That's sort of the perspective uh, that I'm speaking from any ways, uh, speaking as a candidate for the federal parliament and no longer as an activist to uh, fight us for future. So we have presented a few uh, approaches um, and solutions in the uh, election program of the Green Party. I think that could become uh, clearer. I mean, financing is the first point. Of course, uh, structurally, lots uh, of things have to change with uh, public transport, etc. But the first thing is to make sure that nothing more is invested in motorways or uh, federal uh, the streets, roads. We really need a complete turnaround in uh, transport infrastructure planning. And so this individual infrastructure for cars, uh, if we stop expanding that further and just uh, maintain it from now on, that's the first step. And at the same time, really increase attractivity for public transport. Uh, that will make it so that lots of people will switch to public transport. Of course, some people will always stick with their cars and some people will want to uh, drive around with their electric Porsche even in 2030. That will be a minority though. And uh, many people do have, do feel uh, a need to be uh, independent from public transport. Many people also like cycling and so there have been studies. So once you make it easier for people to switch to the bike, then that will also be uh, a step towards that structural change. And um, we can, at the political level, we can create the framework for that. And we can do that by changing the infrastructure planning. Carla talked about uh, towns and cities. But of course, you also need uh, that for train uh, traffic, for instance, we need night trains, for instance. So, I mean, uh, let's say you look at green politicians, they'd be quite happy to take the night train from Berlin to Brussels, I'm sure, but it's not possible. So they have to take the plane. I mean, it would look very different if you could just go to bed at 10 p.m. in Berlin and wake up in the morning in Brussels. And the same is true for your holiday plans. So there are lots of different ways to find solutions. All that's missing is political will. And the problem at the moment is that we have a transport minister in Germany uh, who does just as much uh, transformation as he's forced to do. But that, if we start uh, with that topic, that will be the rest of the night, of course. Yeah, that is a whole other event. Let's not go into that topic of the transport minister. My suggestion would be, to be fair, just very briefly, 
uh, Claudia Kempford, but there has been a question, there was a question to uh, Ms. Mink or a reproach that they're trying to get double uh, support. So Claudia, briefly, thank you. Of course, the topic of um, transport is ours. I mean, we, uh, we've published a lot on um, expert opinions on transport and uh, mobility in cities. So the, the road uh, rules could be changed or a federal mobility law, uh, just to describe it uh, briefly. The entire transport planning at the moment is focused on cars first. It starts with housing. So you always need parking spaces near housing. And uh, you always have to make sure when you plan uh, cycle lanes that it's not going to be an impediment for cars. So the, at the very center of everything is the car at the moment. And we want uh, push and pull elements. And the first uh, step is the political framework. So you can really start with road regulations, road traffic regulations, and uh, that really needs an update. And I also think that we should focus more on, on railways and building new railways instead of new roads. So we do need some changes there and change our priorities. And also in terms of the cost, you maybe have to work with a system of a bonus and malus. There are enough different options how you can change and get away from this fixation on the car, which is also a result of uh, the, the legal framework. I mean, people want to be mobile and they don't want to be dependent on the car, but um, really the um, legislative framework is one reason for this fixation on the car and we do have the ways to change that. Thank you, Sven, for giving me the floor briefly. Thank you, Claudia. So, I mean, I was there in uh, the upper chamber of the federal parliament when uh, somebody tried to uh, get Mr. Schäuble to uh, really uh, change some, make some very small changes. And you know the uh, MP in question, uh, Tarek from the Green Party, he's really a very moderate um, member of parliament, but it took months. But before I get angry or upset at that, Ms. Mink, there was a, a little bit of a reproach to you that you maybe uh, made a few too many demands. Yes. Please uh, switch on your microphone. This is just my style of facilitating, by the way. That's nothing personal. That is fine, completely fine. Yes, double funding, uh, carbon contracts are different. Uh, that's not going to happen, as uh, Kenford said. I mean, there have been drafts. We just, uh, the drafts about what the toolbox could look like. And so, of course, if you have a free allocation, that that's going to be offset against the tools, so the double funding will be impossible. Okay, well, that was that. And then, uh, as far as everything else, we uh, can discuss it in the future. But the top question um, should still be answered before we finish for tonight. Carla had mentioned this topic as well. The question is really perfect for Michael as well. The question, why? Is it that subsidies for uh, negative um, um, acting aren't uh, abolished, uh, kerosene tax, etc.? And then, second, a com comment: Why not couple uh, EU subsidies to um, adhering to climate goals, which is also something that Carla mentioned with the. Uh, failed reform of the CAP. So the parliament wanted to get rid of um, climate hostile um, rules, but it, it never worked out. So why did it not work out? It's a very good question. Well, because the member states don't want it. I mean, that is really the simple response to that. We weren't able to get through politically. And uh, just uh, for the background, on the background, in 2014, the heads of state and government in the EU decided that they wanted to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, and I think in 2009, the G20 decided that, and now it's 2021, but we still have fossil fuel subsidies. And the, 
As, as soon as we get to concrete measures where they're being abolished, uh, it's suddenly Im impossible, either because that's uh, not an EU competence and it's uh, overreaching by the EU, or it's a necessity to have these privileges, um, privileges for kerosene, etc., for commuters. So as soon as you want to get concrete with abolishing them, it gets really difficult. And there's also no common definition, general definition of what is a fossil fuel subsidy. So uh, then people start saying, what is a fossil fuel subsidy? So we have to define it before we can abolish it, which of course are uh, just uh, excuses to not have to act. But uh, the real reason is it's still a main, a major part of many administrations of how we have, how our fiscal systems work. And you'd have to change the entire fiscal system and many countries just don't want to do that. And so the agreement now is to come to a common method, a definition of what's meant by fossil fuel subsidies and then free allocation of a co2 certificate is that also a fossil fuel subsidy i would say yes it is so there are various different ways of protecting the steel industry and decarbonize it which i would be in favor for in favor of uh, so EU funding um, and couple of that uh, funding to adherence to climate goals. Well, you know, so and it's really hard. Um, when we had uh, this discussion about the uh, legality and regularity mechanism, we saw how hard any sort of coupling of funding to anything is because you have to also watch how funding is spent then. And uh, so you also need really a sanction mechanisms with teeth in a uh, case such um, climate goals are not being adhered to. Some of these uh, sanction tools are there. So Germany, for instance, has to now buy CO2 certificates from other countries in the EU because yes, they have uh, adhered to their climate goals, but to not they've overreached on their CO2 budget. But uh, countries can uh, do that and you know, agree on these things um, with each other without public publishing it, so it's not very transparent. So we need a transparent process and fixed prices, at least 100 euros per ton CO2 that's uh, been admitted if it uh, didn't fall within the budget. So I think that would be a starting point. That's something that we have to uh, get done. And that's one of the things that we want to change in July, because we're going to talk about burn sharing between the, the countries then. And that's why we can change that. Thank you. As always, we will make the video available of uh, the video of the webinar, which will also allow you to see the PowerPoint of Claudia Kempfert. I don't want to keep you for much longer, but still, um, I'd like to state three things. For us as Greens, it's really a central point that we manage this 1.5% um, goal and that we move towards that. And um, that is something that we have achieved in part uh, thanks to the pressure of Fridays for Future. You did a lot um, for that. Now we need um, tangible measures, um, which also need to be ambitious. And we'll have to um, make sure that we uh, at the forefront of that debate when it comes to ambitions. I think uh, Baden-Württemberg gave us a good example. You set 2040 as your goal instead of 2050. So that's a step forward and we're getting there. But all these goals and targets are really amounting to nothing if we don't have any concrete measures. We cannot afford to have the same situation as with the previous climate rounds, uh, wonderful goals and targets, and then nothing happens. And I think when we look at the Green Deal, the next one and a half years will really be decisive because the measures are going to be implemented now. And if we don't have the same level of mobilization now, we will lose our battle um, against uh, the polluter um, lobbies. And I don't mean Mr. Mink here, because um, Ms. Mink said we need 
um, proper investment uh, framework and, and uh, we need to stay competitive and so on. And how you do that, uh, certificates, uh, contracts for difference or other instruments is something we can discuss. But I did appreciate that um, you said you want to go there and you need certain instruments. I think um, the market should have its say as well. And we shouldn't have a free allocation of certificates. Um, that's my personal um, opinion. But yeah, I'm very much open to discussing that. I think it is very clear that we, it's in all our interest for the steel industry to become green, for the construction industry to become green, to transform, but not to disappear. That is something that we have to make sure. We need a framework for that. Uh, I, I really agree to that as well. And um, I hope that um, VDI would uh, will also um, enter constructive debate uh, just as you did today, Ms. Mink. And well, this um, topic is sometimes very difficult. Um, climate protection is very difficult. And um, I'm also a finance expert. And I think um, when it comes to tax fraud, tax evasion, money laundering, uh, subsidy fraud, and so on, um, this is now a very important time because there's simply no money left. And I think now we have an opportunity, dear Claudia, to really use our money wisely because it will make us think about how we use our money. And that is why it is an excellent moment now for a fresh start, for looking at things uh, with a different perspective and saying we can spend this money in a way that is a lot better than using it for fossil fuels. This is really an opportunity for us to make these goals happen. There is no money left on a regional, on a national, on a European level. So now when we need to think about how to use our money efficiently, there is a lot of opportunity in that. And um, one positive note, the European Green Deal is continuing. It wasn't abolished despite the pandemic, but I think uh, it would be naive to think, well, all of this is being announced, so it will happen. It will not happen unless we keep fighting for it. And um, even though there have been a lot of debates, there have uh, been failures uh, when it came to the uh, um, common agricultural policy. And um, when we look at the recovery funds, for example, and the way they are being used, um, for example, in Spain or in Italy, is excellent. They are really creating ways of uh, transforming their economy and using the 750 billion in this program in, in a very interesting and positive way. So. 70, uh, sorry, 37 percent of this money have to be used for climate protection, and that is a huge success. So the link has been made between the economy and the environment. Um, in other areas, we haven't made such progress, and that's why we have um, started this petition, uh, saving the European Green Deal to keep mobilizing people to stick to it, to move it forward and uh, not give in to the polluters. And hopefully Fridays for Future will be able to take to the streets again very soon. Thank you. Tschüss. And bye-bye. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Schönen Feiertag. Ebenso. Tschüss. Tschüss. Morgen ist Kirchentag. Ciao, ja. ciao. Gut, ist ja das ist doch ein Feiertag. <lacht> <lacht> And tomorrow is Kirchentag. That's a church convention in Germany of the Protestant Church and the Catholic Church. With a lot of events. Have a nice evening, everyone. Oh.